glad to welcome all of you today. My name is Pastor Linda, for those of you that I haven't met, and I also want to welcome those who are worshiping online. Um, it really helps us if you drop a comment, say good morning, Faith Church, anything you want to say, um, and then and, uh, it helps us to know who's worshiping with us, so we appreciate that. You know, friends, um, a couple weeks ago, we celebrated a glorious Easter, am I right? Yeah. Most of us were here, we remember that, all we were with our families, and we remember what a beautiful day it was. Um, <coughs> the sun was shining, we sang with gusto, it was a joyful worship, and it just felt like the Holy Spirit was filling us with love. And you know what? Some of that joy and peace and love probably carried with us for a few days, and, and um, then life crowds in. Maybe it didn't even give you a few days. Maybe it was like that afternoon we were busy. Ah. Life gets busy. Some of us are mourning the death of loved ones, and that is all around us when we're grieving. We get busy, we get distracted, we let that joy fade just a little bit. And so this, um, in these weeks after Easter, we are exploring the rest of the story. What happened to the disciples after Jesus' death and resurrection? Because they were dealing with a lot of the same stuff that we are dealing with. What does this mean for our lives? What is the rest of the story? So I, uh, last week we talked about faith and doubt, because we do have doubts, that's normal. Today we're talking a bit about faith and grief. Next week we're talking about having faith and forgiveness. So um, I hope that this series is helping us to grow deeper in our discipleship, in our walk with Jesus. So let's, let's worship. Let me pray for us and then we'll stand and, and do our opening. God, I thank you for sending us another beautiful day. Thank you for your presence that is with us and in all circumstances in all ways, whether we are walking through a stormy time or whether we are uh, rejoicing in life. Thank you. Let our worship give glory to you and let it give strength to each believer. Let us go out and share your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll invite you to stand as you're able and let's join in the greeting and the use of prayer and in the first hymn. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Let's pray. Almighty God, through your only Son, you overcame death and opened to us the 
I invite you to uh, pray with me and let's stand out of respect for the gospel. I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Let's pray together. Oh God of light, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read today and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. So on that same day, this is the, the um, first day of the week, and the, the, just to set the scene, the women had been in the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus' body was laid. They met a man they thought was the gardener. It was Jesus. This is that same day. Two of them were the two, their, um, I would say disciples, followers of Jesus. These are not the, the 12 apostles or 11 apostles that are hiding in that room for fear of of what was going to happen next. Um, this is something, and, and think about it. Jesus appeared first to the women and then to these two. They were going to a village, village called Emmaus. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other when you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he asked them, what thing? So they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And yet, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. And, and some of the women in our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they didn't find his body there, they came back and told us that, that um, they had seen a vision of angels. I told them that he was alive. Remember we talked about this last week. Some of those who were went with us to the tomb found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. And then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to, to believe all that the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Well, they came near to the village where they were going, and he walked on as if he were going ahead. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. It's almost evening. The day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Weren't our hearts burning within us when he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? And then that same hour, they, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven disciples and their companions all gathered together. And they were saying, see, they had this experience, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then these two told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. I invite you to be seated. And, and let's talk about this. You know, this, um, this image of life as a journey is a popular metaphor. It's easy to understand. It takes on different layers of meaning. So think about where have you seen this idea that life is a journey? I mean, as we walk or crawl or hang our way along, we're always going somewhere, right? Um, think of all this, the songs that you know uh, about being on the road. Uh, I love John Denver's Take Me Home Country Roads. If you're a country fan, you can probably think of a lot of, of those type of songs. Um, I'm not going to sing Willie Nelson on the road again, but you know it. <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of those songs 
for one night or that's your way of life, whatever it might be. So this story of two friends taking a walk on a journey in life resonates with us. And I like to ask you to use your sacred imaginations to think about this story. Can you picture the two companions trudging along? It's a popular um, subject for paintings, and I've noticed something in these paintings that we'll talk about in just a minute. They're just trudging along. They're going to the village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Uh, we know that one of them was a man named Cleopas. We're told that very clearly in, in the Gospel of Luke. We don't know for sure about the other disciple. But you know what? In the custom of the time, if it was another man, we would know his name. Since his name wasn't given, we can imagine that the unnamed disciple was a woman. Perhaps she was Mrs. Cleopas. Made sense because they were going to the same village, to the same house. They obviously were going to stay there together. I think that makes a lot of sense. But if you ever see this painting, and you can probably Google it and pull it up if you don't have access to it, um, I've noticed it doesn't matter who has painted this. You can tell that the, the disciple in the middle is Jesus because he kind of has turned his head and, you know, we can assume that that, you know, he's usually out a little in front, so, you know, that's leadership. You can tell that the other individual in the painting is a man. Got a um, but you, all the paintings I looked at, you can never quite tell if the other one is a man or a woman. You don't see the face, you don't see the beard, and I checked a lot of paintings because I'm always wanting to know this. So you may, you may, if you find one, tell me about it. I'd like to know. Um, but in, in my brief research, I'm like, oh, maybe these artists wanted to leave room for the possibility that this was Mr. and Mrs. Cuevas going to the same home together. Whatever, it's just an interesting side note. As these two are walking along, they are they are joined by Jesus. And then somehow, they don't recognize him. We're not told how. But they're just, they're kept from recognizing the resurrected Christ. But, you know, it's, it's a bodily resurrection. He has a body. He's walking along with them. So Jesus asks what they're talking about. Do you think he might have already known? He just wants them to say it. Gets them to talk about it. Well, they are so sad. They can barely talk. They can barely walk. And, and so when Jesus asks them that, they just stand still. And with Jesus' patient prompting, they begin to spill out their grief and their sadness. I mean, some of us are grieving right now. Some of us remember when grief was so active in our life, we felt so sad. We could barely move. We longed for an understanding friend to listen to us. And friends, you may practice the, the, the ministry of presence is what I call it. When you go and visit somebody that is grieving, you don't have to worry about what you're going to say. You just be there with them. You just be there to listen. Or maybe even to be there in silence together. We get it, that sadness, that heaviness. And Jesus listened to the full story. This is why it's so important. He asked them, and he listened. And then he was taking in all their disappointment, their dashed hopes. And then, and only after listening, he begins to explain to them all that the scripture had promised about the Messiah, the Savior. They would have known that, but probably just forgotten it, as we do in our grief. Well, they continue on to get to the village of Emmaus, and then Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas feel their spirits lighten, their hope is returning, and so hospitality just breaks out. You know, that's a high value in biblical times. So they invite the stranger to come in to, to stay with them, to eat with them. And as they do, they asked the guest to bless the food. He did that. He broke the bread. He gave it to them. And somehow their eyes were opened. And they could see their companion clearly. They recognized Jesus. 
then they disappear from their site in order to appear to the other disciples. That's what I wanted to, Logan and Ezra and Hannah to, to catch if they heard this story in Sunday school. It's not like, I think the Bible says it vanishes. to say, in order to appear to others. So, Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas, or these two friends, however you want to imagine them, said to each other, wasn't it like a fire that was burning within us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? This is a big aha moment for them. And they got up at once and they went back to Jerusalem. Even though it's getting near dark, they couldn't wait. Um, these seven miles that they had trudged wearily along now seemed to fly by in a flash. They, they, they couldn't keep this joy to themselves. And they were compelled to share with the other disciples. The, the resurrected Christ, the bread of life, was revealed in the breaking of the bread. Their joy was so great. Mr. and Mrs. Cleavis couldn't keep it to themselves. I almost wish we were having communion today. That would be a beautiful end to the story, but um, we will do that. We usually do it on first Sunday of the month, so we'll just we'll remember that. Well, friends, what does this story mean for us today? This story teaches us about Christ's presence in our life. Christ is our companion on the journey of life. Um, the, the root of that word, companion, I love this word, it means with bread. With bread. A companion is someone who accompanies us, oh, there's that root word again, accompanies us on a journey and often shares bread with us, literally and figuratively. So, who are you on a journey with, a journey through life? Who are your friends around the table? Who do you eat? In the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, remember we're in Luke, but here in John's Gospel, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never hunger. See, as bread nourishes us physically, so Jesus nourishes us spiritually. Jesus says, I am the living bread. The bread I give you is my flesh. This was hard for people to understand then as it is now. I give it so the world may live. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in him. Whoever eats me will live. When Jesus said that, as John reported it, then a lot of people stopped following him. They couldn't understand it. They didn't like it. Um, and I just didn't get it. They won't follow that guy anymore. He talked about being the bread of life. I'm not saying that we have it all figured out either. Sometimes that's the, the, the leap of faith that we have to take. And um, when we taste that bread, or we experience that fellowship around the table, and recognize that God's presence is with us. Then we get a little glimmer of what the kingdom of heaven is like, what Jesus is talking about, what that is. Jesus blessed and broke the bread so the disciples could see who truly was. And that's when their eyes were opened. You know, maybe Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas had been part of that crowd of 5,000 people when uh, Jesus had fed that whole group with a, a few fish and some loaves of bread. Maybe they knew about that last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. And it was not simply the, the, the physical act of handling the bread, it was that some quality of Jesus himself went into that breaking. Somehow, Jesus was invested in that breaking. Think of it. While the few loaves and fish remained whole in his hands, they didn't feed anyone. It was when he broke them that the multitudes were nourished too. Think of this, friends. It's like this with every meal. Um, so, What's that because we like to go to Longhorn? They serve the most delicious bread at Longhorn. They always bring it out first. It sits there on the table. Think of it. It doesn't nourish anybody around that table as long as we 
broken, that he fed the multitudes, broken daily in the pain of his compassion, and in the untiring way that he gave of himself to their needs. Broken at last on Calvary, the ultimate sacrifice. In order to make his point of how close God desires to be to people, Jesus says quite literally, eat me, consume me, put me on, wear me, take me into yourself, participate with me in my Father's kingdom, in my Father's work, lose yourself, lose your life for my sake. Let go of established ways. Take me into yourself and receive eternal life. Jesus is teaching people in the most vivid way possible that God is not distant, out there, unknowable, untouchable. God desires to be in relationship with people, with each person to be their close companion on life's journey. A relationship with the living God is as necessary for our spirits as bread is necessary for physical health. And then after his resurrection, Jesus promised that he would be with us everywhere. I think of that promise in light of the pandemic that we come through. We're still experiencing a bit. Think about how hard that was. Jesus had to be with those weary nurses and doctors. Jesus is with patients that are admitted to the hospital and who are struggling to breathe. Jesus is with their families who are finding new routines and new ways of doing things. Jesus is with single people who are staying home and feeling lonely. Jesus is with students who are learning online. Well, I do a lot of my meetings online now. Jesus is with people who have lost their jobs and who are having a hard time paying their bills and putting food on the table. Jesus is with leaders who are making tough decisions for the sake of their communities. Jesus is with each one of us as we navigate the uncertainty of this journey. So friends, another thing that this story teaches us is that we are called to be companions in Christ with others on the journey. I should wrote my thesis on that, so I, I will, I can get Girl Scout with you here with you, but I'm not, but I just love this story. And what does it mean to be companions in Christ? See, I believe that we are all companions on a spiritual journey, seeking to know and love and serve God. That thing of it, that joy of those Emmaus travelers was multiplied because it was shared. They couldn't keep it to themselves. Their hearts were burning with the good news of Jesus Christ, and they heard back to their community of believers. Well, today here we are, followers of Jesus, called to be the church. We come together in this community of faith. We remember all that Jesus has done for us. And then we leave, we go out to share Christ. Just as Jesus caught up to Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas in the midst of their own journey, and then became part of it himself, and then in the end baptizing them with his blessing, those of us in the church still believe that this is the way that Christ often comes into our lives. Because, you know, friends, we are busy. We're off on our own journeys. We've got these goals that we think we're headed for. We are pursuing some kind of objective. We are, are totally submerged in our own concerns. We are determined and ambitious, and we're outrunning the spiritual life. And then it happens. It may be a half step, and we're caught up. We're arrested by the sudden awareness of another presence. We had expected it. We don't always recognize it immediately. It just divides. The spirit abides. And just as with those amazed travelers, it comes into clear focus in due time. 
sometimes through talking with another friend. And we see that the Holy Spirit accompanies us on our own journeys. And with that last verse in this chapter, I hope that somewhere along the way, it will be with each one of us as it was with these two travelers. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. How do you recognize what God is doing in your life?
we are celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. And so um, about once a month, we are blessed by this video that, that Ella Adam is putting together. And so um, we're, we're going to watch the video and hear what a few of our friends have to say about what? the impact of this church.
a full worship to walk the halls and look at the preschool art show. If you haven't done it, I just encourage you to, to enjoy that. Um, they had a big uh, celebration yesterday, and they're leaving it up for a little while for us to enjoy, so that is delightful. And then also we have the new Upper Room Daily Devotional, so we have large print regular. And I always encourage you to um, take us home, read it in your quiet time, let that guide your, your day and your prayers. Um, I will tell you that I, I pick up any of the leftovers and I hand them out when we do the food distribution. And those people are hungry. They're hungry not only for the food that we're getting, but, but they are hungry for the Word of God. And they thank you for that and they're so blessed. So, but I always 